Hello, uh, I am Susan Fisher. I am uh, the executive director of the Rini and Haim Gross Foundation in New York City. Uh, it's the historic house museum and uh, sculpture studio of American sculptor Haim Gross. And I'm going to be speaking on Friday about American sculptors as authors. Um, but this morning, I um, am very happy to moderate um, this panel with two speakers. Uh, the first of whom is um, Professor Brian Zygmunt. Uh, professor Zygmunt is the Associate Professor of Art History at Clark University. He is the author um, of the book Portraiture and Politics in New York City, 1790 to 1825, Gilbert Stewart, John Vanderlyn, John Trumbull, and John Wesley Jarvis. Uh, professor Zygmunt also uh, currently serves as the contributing editor of American Art at Smart History, which is uh, a peer-reviewed online art history textbook. And um, also very interestingly, um, Professor Zygmunt in 2013 was a Fulbright Professor of American Studies um, here in Poland uh, in the Department of Transatlantic and Media Studies at the University of Lodz. Uh, Professor Zygmunt today is going to be um, giving a paper entitled uh, Charles Wilson Peale, The Enlightenment and the Great Mastodon. Identity, Science, and Art in Early Federal America. So please help me to in, uh, welcome Professor Zygmunt. Good morning. And of course, many of us know that it's actually Wuj, which is something I learned uh, during my six months in Poland. He began as a saddle maker, taught dancing lessons to a colonial American clientele, completed mezzotints in London, and served as an officer in the Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War. He also became one of the most prolific artists of his era. Yet despite this background, the name Charles Wilson Peale is not one immediately familiar to those outside the circles of American art history. However, it would be difficult to overestimate his artistic prominence in the United States during the decades surrounding the turn of the 19th century. As scholars in the field of American art history have made clear, Peel, Peel's reputation rests in the pantheon of American portraitists. He painted the social, the political, and the economic elite of his day. These sitters included scientists, presidents, and prominent merchants. Even had he never picked up a paintbrush, Peel would be remembered today as one for founding one of the first natural history museums in the United States. This museum officially opened on 18 July 1876, and collecting, classifying, and exhibiting objects occupied nearly the entire Peel family for many a decade to follow. Without doubt, art and nature were Charles Wilson Peel's great passions in life. Peel went so far as to name his children after prominent artists and scientists. These include Raphael, Rembrandt, Rubens, Titian, and Helica Kaufman, seemingly running out of artists. He then named one Linnaeus and Franklin. In the summer of 1801, Peel paid John Maston $300 to excavate the skeletal remains of a fossilized mastodon the farmer had unearthed on his New York estate. The painting that followed, The Exhumation of the Mastodon, is amongst Peel's most recognized and complicated compositions. Indeed, its place of prominence within the canon of American art history is reinforced by the extensive attention this painting has received over the past 50 years. In 1981, Lillian Miller, then editor of the Peel Papers, wrote, and I quote, until recently, the painting has been regarded as either an amusing record of the museum or an example of the amplification of American self-portraiture merging with genre painting. Miller then convincingly examined Peel's work within the context of 18th century historical paintings. Laura Regal has per persuasively argued that the exhumation of the Mastodon should be considered within the political climate of early 19th century America. More recently, David Bingham has explored Peel's painting as a biblical metaphor involving the Great Deluge. My goal today is not to discredit any other interpretation of Peel's masterwork. 
Instead, I aspire to add to the panoply of meanings that this complicated work likely held for both artists and the early 19th, early 19th century American audience that viewed it. I believe one particular interpretation has thus far been overlooked, that of the interaction of religion and science in early federal America. In order to fully explore the exhumation of the Mastodon within the context of religion and science, it is important to first establish the prevailing feelings about these two disparate fields during the 17th and 18th centuries. An excellent point of departure are the intellectual ruminations of James Usher, Archbishop of Armagh. Usher wrote The Annals of the Old Testament, a treatise which appeared in Latin and English editions by 1658. In his magnum opus, Usher utilized a literal translation of the book of Genesis to calculate the exact moment of divine creation, the evening before the 23rd of October, 4004 BCE. Although several ma mathematicians, astronomers, and popes attempted to refine Usher's dating in the decades to come, Johannes Kepler and Sir Isaac Newton amongst others, both scholars and non-academics alike commonly accepted the view of a 5,700-year-old Earth during the 17th century. Moreover, the idea of young Earth creationism retained a near monopoly until at least the end of the 18th century. Indeed, James Hutton's Theory of the Earth, published in 1795, was amongst the first formal and forceful arguments against the theory of young Earth creationisms. I would add here that it's nearly unreadable, although we know that Peel tried. However, there is no doubt that many around the year 1800 accepted the young Earth theory as scientific fact, both in the United Kingdom and in the United States. Clearly, this young Earth idea seems to clash with the very idea of fossilization. Without doubt, the length of time it takes for organic matter to chemically transform into a fossil far exceeds the amount of time that the young earth creationists believe God in God's entire creation itself had existed. There is another scientific principle that was commonly accepted during the 18th and 19th century that further adds to the understanding of Peel's painting, a concept called the great chain of being. Perhaps the most important text on this subject is Arthur Lovejoy's The Great Chain of Being, a study of the history of an idea. In it, Lovejoy chronicles the birth and subsequent modification of this particular philosophical construction. Given its importance and acceptance during the 18th century and the way in which it so prominently contributes to the understanding of Peel's work, a short discussion of the chain of being is exceptionally important. According to Lovejoy, and I quote, it was in the 18th century that the conception of the universe as a chain of being and the principles that underlay this conception, plentitude, continuity, and gradation, attained their widest diffusion and acceptance, end quote. These three concepts deserve a brief explanation. The concept of plentitude involved the great variety and abundance of life and was used as justification for the idea of continuity, the notion that every kind of organism ever created by the divine maker still exists in an original and unchanged form. Gradation describes the relatedness of the animal kingdom. When put together, plentitude, continuity, and gradation helped explain, for the 18th century mind at least, the natural world in which they lived. One could begin with the simplest organism then known and ascend a single run of the animal kingdom into a slightly more complicated organism. This process of ascension could be repeated ad infinitum until we would eventually progress through nearly imperceptible steps to God's most perfect earthly creation, man. Perhaps the most important of these principles when considering Peel's painting is that of continuity. 
a concept that conveniently meshed with a 5,800-year-old view of the Earth. Continuity assumes that everything that existed at the moment of creation still existed in the 18th century in an unchanged state. Given this view, the concept of extinction was untenable. God would not create any organism, only to later destroy it, for this would indicate a sense of divine, inf divine fallibility, an idea far removed from the 18th century theological mindset. Edmund Law, later Bishop of Carlisle, wrote in 70, 732 that, and I quote, there is no manner of chasm or void, no link deficient in the great chain of beings. The reason is that the nature is as full as God would allow or saw proper. Even Thomas Jefferson believed in the underlying notion of the great chain of being. Jefferson wrote his first draft on the Notes of State of Virginia in 1781, revisions in 1782 and 83, and a move to Paris allowed him to anonymously publish this dissertation in 1784. Jefferson wrote notes as a defense to the questions two prominent French naturalists presented about the inferior fauna of the New World. For Jefferson, the mastodon was tangible proof of the vibrancy of North American mammalia. Furthermore, Jefferson believed that the United States was so vast and unexplored that herds of the great incognitum, as the mastodon was then called, still roamed North America. His deductive powers place faith in the great chain of being. Jefferson wrote, and I quote to you, the bones of the mammoth which have been found in America are as large as those found in the old world. It may be asked why I insert the mammoth as if it still existed. I ask in return, why should I not? Such is the economy of nature that no instance can be produced of her having permitted any one race of her animals to become extinct or of her having formed any link of her great work so weak as to be broken. Tom got that wrong. Peel and Jefferson had something else in common aside from their mutual interest in mastodons. They were both committed deists. Few scholars have written on Peel's religious views. David Ward, historian and deputy editor of the Peel Papers, describes Peel as a man with, quote, no religious faith. Ward continues writing, and I quote, Peel's participation in religion was limited to intellectual interest and a desire not to, f not to disturb the proprieties. He was a deist of almost pure variety. Although Peel may not have worshiped within a church, his cathedral was that of nature. That word, nature, appears again and again within print material advertising his museum. The first tickets for Peel's museum printed in 1788, features an open book with the word nature printed across the gutter. This book seems to emanate light, almost like that of a divine halo. Underneath the open book are the words, the birds and bees will teach thee. The same open book was featured on the title page of a scientific description, descriptive catalog of Peel's museum. And a similarly open tomed this time nature and art written across the right hand page appears in a magic lanthorn announcement in a Philadelphian newspaper. The concept of nature was clearly on Charles Wilson Peale's mind during the majority of his adulthood and it is under this broad umbrella that the exodon of the exhumation of the Macedon may be considered. Peale was clearly a member of the Enlightenment. As a deist, he consciously rejected the Christian doctrines that were prevalent in the United States during the early decades of the 19th century. As such, Peel was, able, was free to reject the timeline of creation Archbishop Usher established through a literal translation of the book of Genesis. Thus, Peel was able to conceive the Earth's timeline expending, extending beyond a mere five and a half millennia. This is a crucial point for as James Hutton and later acknowledged, even during the late 18th century, 
the process of fossilization was one that likely took tens of thousands of years, if not more, an amount of time incongruent with a young Earth view of the world. Commentary regarding another important idea lay just beneath the surface of Peel's important painting. The chain of being was one of the most widely held philosophical notions during Peel's time. Lovejoy remarked that it was in the 18th century that the belief in the great chain of being attained its widest acceptance. This theory, which had three main tenets, plentitude, continuity, and gradation, pushed believers in the Mastodon into a very difficult position. To acknowledge that the Mastodon existed at one time, as skeletal remains strongly indicated that it once had, was to assert that they still roamed the woods of North America. As no Mastodons had yet been found roaming the woods of North America, they were either exceptionally well hidden, a difficult feat for a beast so large, or the concept of continuity within the great chain of beings was an invalid supposition. Religion and science are uneasy bedfellows today, and they were so during Pearl's, Peel's own lifetime as well. While Peel believed in a god, he did not subscribe to the Judeo-Christian version of an almighty that should be prayed to or who interfered with people's lives. Thus, Peel was free to reject dogmatic religious texts, the Jewish and Christian Bible amongst others, and instead chose to exercise his own reason and intellect. It was this sense of reason that allowed Peel to conceive of geological time rather than a young earth view of creation. It was a sense of intellect that allowed the artist to acknowledge that animals that had once been created could later become extinct. One can see many things when viewing Peel's The Exhumation of the Mastodon. Indeed, it is a complicated image painted during complicated times. Amongst other interpretations, this work is about, this, about science, religion, and how these fields of knowledge interacted with and informed one another around the year 1800. Peel's painting is not simply about excavating a Macedon skeleton in upstate New York in 1801. Indeed, it speaks to a rejection of a view of creation James Usher professed in the 17th century and is a dismissal of the, an idea that many Christians and some deists held dear, continuity within God's great chain. Lillian M Miller commented that Peel conceived this painting as a historical composition, and in many regards, I believe this is true. During Peel's time, the importance of history paintings resided in the ways in which they could morally instruct an art-viewing public. These were lessons Peel's learned while studying painting with Benjamin West, perhaps the most famous 18th century history painter in the English-speaking world. In this regard, Peel's work is a history painting. However, the message it contains is not one about love of country, sacrifice for the sake of others, or following the teachings of Jesus Christ. Instead, in the exhumation of the Mastodon, Charles Wilson Peel forcefully and clearly speaks to the elevation of science, intellect, and reason over that of religious faith. faith. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, our next speaker is Professor Marek Wilzinski. He teaches American literature um, at the universities of Zanks and Warsaw. Um, he has published widely on American and Polish literature, as well as translated into Polish contemporary American fiction and the essays of Hayden White. Um, today, he's going to be speaking um, about the Americanization of the sublime, Washington Alston and Thomas Cole as theorists of American art. Please um, help me welcome Professor Wilzinski. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, there, there will be no pictures, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> 
I don't hold a degree in art history, so maybe that explains it to a certain degree. But there will be handouts, and Filip Lipinski will, has already distributed handouts, right? Uh, Benedict Anderson has demonstrated that the proliferation of print as commodity has been the crucial factor which determined the rise of various imagined communities, particularly those of a post-colonial origin. It remains an open question whether the culture of the United States can be legitimately called post-colonial. After all, the first 13 states did not much differ from the British colonies they used to be, at least in socioeconomic and broadly cultural terms. Yet since the publication of Michael Warner's seminal study, The Letters of the Republic, publication in the public sphere in 18th century America, it has become obvious that without the print culture, the American Revolution would have been quite different if successful at all. In her now classic books on the 19th century American painting, Barbara Novak has shown that painting, and for that matter, landscape painting more than historical representations related to the War of Independence, also significantly contributed to early US nationalism. Summing up her analysis of the ideological grip on nature in the age of Emerson, Novak writes, and I quote, with such a range of religious, moral, philosophic, and social ideas projected onto the American landscape, it is clear that the painters who took it upon themselves to deal with this loaded subject were involved not only with art, but with the iconography of nationalism. In painting the face of God in the landscape so that the less gifted might recognize and share in that benevolent spirituality, there were among the spiritual leaders of America's flock. Uh, through this idea of community, we can approach a firm understanding of the role of landscape not only in American art, but in American life, especially before the Civil War. The idea of this community through nature runs clearly through all aspects of American social life in the first half of the 19th century." End of quote. Now, after 35 years that passed since making that statement, the interest in the connections among American thought literature and the plastic arts, as well as between the US and Britain in a transatlantic perspective, has resulted in a number of publications, perhaps most recently a collection of essays called Transatlantic Romanticism, British and American Art and Literature, 1790-1860, edited by Andrew Hemingway and Alan Wallach. Novak's pioneering claims have been continued and supplemented by scholars working across the borderline traditionally separating literary and cultural studies and art history, while her emphasis on the role of Washington Alston and Thomas Cole, both very much aware of the aesthetic categories of the beautiful, the sublime, and the picturesque, inherited from Burke and the British painters and theorists of landscape gardening, has remained uncontested. Still, even though Austin's and Cole's achievements in art have been attracting academic interest for decades, somehow particularly the former's contribution to American reflection on painting has been quite surprisingly rather neglected. A good starting point for a comparison of Austin and Cole as regards their conscious support of the US national identity and culture may be a brief reading of their poems. Alston's America to Great Britain, included in the volume Sylphs of the Season of 1813, and Cole's Niagara, written in May 1829, but published only in 1972. America to Great Britain, a tribute to the father's native soil, ends with the following stanza, and this is quote, quotation number one on your handouts. While the manners, while the arts that mold a nation's soul still cling around our hearts between that ocean roll, our joint communion breaking with the sun, yet still from either big beach, the voice of blood shall reach more audible than speech, we are one. In fact, having published such, published such a poem in 1813 during a war between his country and Great Britain, the poet must have been a bit embarrassed since he decided to add to it a footnote. This alludes merely to the moral union of the two countries. 
Uh, the author would not have it supposed that the tribute of respect offered in these stanzas to the land of his ancestors would be paid by him, it at the expense of the independence of that which gave him birth." End of quote. Born on a South Carolina plantation, Austin could legally run for president, but neither his Harvard education nor marriage to Ann Channing, nor residence in Boston, could affect his attitude of basic cultural loyalty to the crown, characteristic of the former colonies south of the Mason-Dixon line long after the revolution. On the other hand, Cole, a British-born immigrant, concluded his response to the view of Niagara Falls as follows, and that's quotation number two. Ages untold thy voice broke forth unheard, but by the shrinking wolf or the, time, or, or the timorous deer, or wandering savage of the echoing wild, under an enterprise sublime unbarred the mighty portals of the golden west, and midst its teeming fullness thou wast found majestic in the wilderness enthroned. The contrast with Alston's message appears quite striking. Here the focus is on the emblematic wilderness populated by animals and Indians, while the term uh, enterprise sublime most likely refers to the United States itself. Moreover, Niagara has become a natural counterpart of the royal majesty from the other side of the water, enthroned in the landscape to be discovered, found by American settlers. Thus, Cole not only made a reference to the discourse of the sublime, but did it in an explicitly political manner, applying it simultaneously to nature and to the country he chose to call his own. A few years later, in the early 1830s, Alston would deliver in Cambridge Port, where he lived, to a select audience of two friends, Professor Cornelius Conway Felton of Harvard and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a series of lectures on art to be published posthumously in 1850. There, he would also take into consideration the concept of the sublime, yet in a different and above all much elaborate way. Probably inspired by Reynolds's discourses on art, and definitely by Burke's philosophical inquiry, Alston proposed in the introductory discourse a whole elaborate system of categories superimposed on beauty once the spectator ascends thence into the moral. A continuous chain of creation begins with elegance and then through majesty and grandeur reaches a realm where the physical seems almost to vanish and a new form rises before us, so mysterious, so undefined and elusive to the senses that we turn as if for its more distinct image within ourselves and there with wonder amazement, awe, we see, see it filling, distending, stretching every faculty, till, like the giant of Otranto, it seems almost to burst the imagination. Under this strange confluence of op opposite emotions, this terrible pleasure, we call this awful form sublimity. First, in his account of the sublime, Alston actually goes far beyond both Reynolds's laconic formulations rooted in pseudo-Longinus and Burke's empirical sensualism. His vocabulary, including such terms as faculty and imagination, seems quite close to the Kantian diction of the critique of judgment, though he could not read Kant in German. A longtime friend of Coleridge, he might have discussed with the English poet various problems of aesthetics, but their correspondence reveals no traces of such discussions. Second, it is interesting that the painter used in his argument an example taken from literature, the Gothic novel by Horace Walpole. On another occasion, just several pages earlier, he made a literary reference as well to Macbeth and Hamlet, once again unmistakably English. All in all then, Alston's sublime had nothing to do with the United States or with space other than the inner space of mind. In that inner space of the narrator's memory in Monaldi, Alston's Gothic romance of 1822, 
he placed the only verbal landscape of the American Northeast that can be found in his written oeuvre. <coughs> Excuse me. And now comes our quote number three on the handout. There is sometimes so striking a resemblance between the autumnal sky of Italy and that of New England at the same season that when the peculiar features of the scenery are obscured by twilight, it needs but little aid of the imagination in an American traveler to fancy himself in his own country. The bright orange of the horizon fading into a low yellow and here and there broken by a slender bar of molten gold with the broad mass pale, ap pale apple green blending above and the sheet of deep azure over these gradually darkening to the zenith, all carry him back to his dearer home. The connection or perhaps tension between the United States and Italy was characteristic of both Alston and Cole since both of them learned most from Claude Laurent and Salvator Rosa in Roman Campania. They visited Rome and its environs as often as their financial situation allowed them to do so. As Novak writes with reference to Cole, using and reusing Salvatore's gnarled trees and Claude's coulisses and glittering ponds, he deftly imposed details of American scenery upon formulae derived from earlier prototypes or upon his own favorite compositional schema, which he would repeat whether the locale were the Catskills or the White Mountains. The two continents and two countries coalesced in the works of both artists, even though one was more willing, in part under the pressure of demanding patrons, to paint the savage landscapes of the United States than the other, long storing in his mind's eye the views of Italy and faces of young Italian women. In Austin's case, nostalgia worked both ways to make him an incurable romantic, when in the Apennines, his narrator dreams about New England, and when in Boston, he himself could not forget the picturesque details of his European sojourn. Cole liked American nature much better than his elder colleague, who preferred his Boston studio to strolling around in the White Mountains. The published fragments of his journal include a few accounts of trips to the Catskills and the Hudson River Valley. The first dated November 1834, the last August 1846. The lengthy entry of July 5th, 1835 demonstrates that he could also, like Alston, make use of literature when thinking about the aesthetic qualities of the visible world. His literary associations, though, were quite different. And then, uh, then comes the last uh, quotation on your handouts. The first seven miles by means of agreeable conversation and the blessed moon we passed over merrily. But then the moon sank behind the piney ridge of the North Mountain and we began to be thirsty and were disappointed by not finding a spring by Lawrence's. The inmates of the house appeared to be sound asleep and we deemed it better to pursue our way to Rip Van Winkle's Hollow about three miles further than to disturb the slumberers. It was midnight when we sat down by the pure warbling stream that comes jumping down from the grand amphitheater of wooded mountains called Rip Van Winkle's Cove. There was a tin vessel glittering by the stream placed there for the use of travelers by some generous soul or perhaps some fairy who expected us as, at that silent hour. Be that as it may, we drank from it the, pool, the cool pure water again and again, and drafts were more delicious even than those of Rip could possibly have been um, when he took the somniferous potion from the famous keg in or near the selfsame place. It was a solemn scene, dark forests, rugged rocks, towering mountains encompassed us and the night breeze brought the sound of waving trees, falling streams, and the clear chant of the whippoorwill to our listening, eyes, listening ears. It was grand, it was sublime to be thus by ourselves at midnight in the midst of solitude of woods and mountains, while the world beside was slumbering. Contrary to Alston, Cole mentions the sublime quite intuitively, 
outside any aesthetic system, but he does it in a testimony of a genuine experience of American scenery, and with, and with reference to Washington Irving's tale, actually set in the area, a text already acknowledged at that time as culturally significant on both sides of the Atlantic. The result is a polysemiotic palimpsest, nature described through vernacular literature and, in the future, also painted. In the same journal entry, the artist wrote, before us spread the virgin waters which the prow of the sketcher had never curled, green woods enfolding them whose venerable masses had never figured in transatlantic annuals, and far away the stern blue mountains whose forms were ne'er beheld by Claude or Salvator or been subjected to the canvas by the innumerable dabblers in paint for all time past. The painter of American scenery has indeed privileges superior to any other. All nature is new to art." End of quote. It seems as if under the pressure of that radical wild newness, European aesthetic distinctions must blur and clear-cut concepts coalesce. In the mountains of New Hampshire, that's another quote, there is a union of the picturesque, the sublime, and the magnificent. When, is, when in September 1846, Cole visited Niagara for the second time, he calls the falls within one and the same sentence, great, glorious, sublime, and beautiful. Like Margaret Fuller, more than four years before, who was disappointed with her own inability to appreciate the view properly, he has a problem with what he can see. It is limited in that the human mind can conceive of a cataract much greater and more sublime. But eventually he retracts his reservation as a true patriot. Great, glorious, and sublime Niagara, wonder of the world, I do not disparage thee. Thou hast the power, thou hast the power to move the deep soul. The nationalist obligation wins and eliminates trouble rooted in the Kantian discrepancy between the ideas of reason and actual sense data. After Alston's death in 1843, Cole paid his homage to the elder colleague. Quote, he was truly a distinguished artist and has executed some works which will never cease to be highly prized and considered a great work of art. On the other hand, though, he admitted to himself in a note probably not intended for publication, fine as I consider many of Alston's works and superior as I think he is to most of the artists of his time, I have never thought that he was a man of very original genius. His pictures, beautiful as they are, always reminded me of some work or school of art, something I have seen before, either in intention composition, or color. That was, of course, not what genuinely American art was supposed to be, and Cole knew it as well as Emerson, who in 1842 wrote in his journal with a haunting sense of regret. We have our culture like Alston from Europe and are Europeans. Cole was a European himself, yet he decided to become an American. Alston was an American, but on the contrary, he did not mind being a European, at least as a painter. As a theorist of the sublime, the author of lectures on art proved sophisticated and self-conscious enough to observe conceptual rigor and even managed, probably thanks to Coleridge, to comprehend the gist of Kant's idea of das Erhabene. He understood what he was writing about, and perhaps like Poe in the same period, refused to take into consideration Americanness as a necessary value. The Americanization of the sublime, which however lost in the process its distinctive meaning and turned into little more than an emphatic term of admiration, took place in the reflection of Cole, although in fact both artists followed the conventions of landscape painting developed by Claude Laurent and Salvatore Rosa. Still, Cole reluctantly catered for the US market's demand for the recognizably local instead of the universal, so that his painting as commodity, to adapt Anderson's phrase to visual arts, 
contributed to the discourse of cultural nationalism just as much as his well-known American scenery essay of 1836. In such a perspective, the Hudson River School emerges as the first symbolic national institution of American art. Thank you. Is this on? Hello? Is it, you can hear me, okay. Um, thank you very much for those two um, fascinating papers. It really set uh, such a solid foundation, I think, for, um, for today and the next two days. Uh, I believe we have a couple of minutes for questions. I don't want to get you off schedule. I, I think it's supposed to end at noon, but maybe one or two questions. Um, um, I think I saw a raised hand. Jersey, were you raising your hand? No. We have a few minutes, okay. Any questions for our speakers? There's one, um, Professor Doss, I believe, yeah. Brian, I'm wondering if you've been to the Creation Museum? And if you might reflect on how they um, have sort of updated that painting uh, in uh, Kentucky. You know, I have a colleague who teaches at Western Kentucky, um, and he's been there. I have not, although I, I sort of wish I could go and am scared to death to go. Um, but no, I have not been there. It would be intriguing. I know he's mentioned that there are marvelous dioramas of people walking around with dinosaurs and things like that. And what a great party that would have been. <laughs> I actually was, your paper, Brian, actually was, I saw that painting anew, the, the Char Peel's painting of examining the Mastodon. And I was wondering if you could say a few words about the painting itself, sort of the, the elements within the painting, because I'd never really seen the, the drainage system which I assume that's what that is, as sort of a link or a great chain, so the repetition of elements. So I was wondering if you could say a few words maybe about the painting. I can put it up on the screen. You know, I should have turned around and pointed to the, the storm clouds and at least gotten the sublime in uh, for my talk today. Um, you know, it is sort of an interesting composition if you, if you look at it sort of geometrically because one of the things that Peel had to do was construct this pyramidal composition or this pyramidal thing that um, drained water because the, you know they, they had to dig it out of the ground and the, the, the groundwater had seeped up and so they had to drain it out. And so there is sort of this pyramidal construction with literally like kids running in a gerbil wheel uh, that were bucketing out the water. Um, and then beyond that, it, from a compositional point of view, it is this very um, non-historical family portrait of people who were never there people who were dead at the time, people Peel wish had been there, and so it really is this sort of interesting arrangement of portrait and like a historical event trying to capture some of that, but putting sort of like Trumbull's uh, famous painting of the, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. N nobody sat like that <laughs> the whole time. Some people weren't there and he put them all in, and the same is true of this composition. Like Peel's first wife, who had been dead for 15 years, I think, is shown with one of, I think, little Linnaeus <laughs> Peel, so. Yeah. Uh, Brian, if I may, just a brief comment on the, on the great chain of being. Actually, it, it seems that the idea of the great chain of being actually survived deists. Uh, and it appeared later on in the 1830s and 1840s in Emerson's writings, for instance. When Emerson came to Paris and he had his famous vision in, in, in front of one of the glass cabinets in the Museum of Natural History, he said to himself, I feel a centipede in me. Have you ever felt a centipede in you? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he watched uh, all those uh, exhibits, starting with, you know, with stones and going through the, the smallest visible organisms to be capped finally, of course, with Homo sapiens sapiens, right? So, uh, uh, so that was a version of the great chain of being that somehow uh, accepted the idea that certain species 
became extinct, right? Uh, while the continuity of the chain uh, uh, was maintained somehow. We now have something to talk about at lunch. Uh, thank you very much, Marek, for that extraordinarily interesting presentation. Um, I'm wondering about the currency of British philosophical criticism in the United States in the period you've been discussing, because um, by the time you're talking about uh, the, the, um, the, the tradition is really at its end. You know, it, it comes to an end with uh, Payne Knight's uh, treatise and, and the writings of Dougald Stewart and Francis Jeffrey, and already in, in, in you, you one can see the corrosive effects of the uh, empiricist attempt to maintain rigid norms and rigid categories in Payne Knight's work. Um, and if we think about Gilpin, Gilpin thought you could have uh, a, a sublime beauty, and he didn't see, and, and, and of course, he, for him, anything, what was really picturesque was what we would regard as, as, as sublime primarily. For him, the picturesque was epitomized by Salvatore Rosa rather than anybody else. So um, I, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what, what, what particular texts you think uh, Alston and, and, um, and Cole took their reference points from. I, I'm not sure that the use of faculty and imagination really mean that um, uh, Alston was thinking about Kant, because both those terms are current in philosophical criticism more generally. Um, as far as uh, you know, the popularity of British text in the States as, as that time is concerned, uh, it was obviously Burke who was extremely widely read. Americans were less interested in the theorists of landscape gardening. Uh, as far as I know, there were no really magnificent attempts to do the same in, in the States. Uh, of course, Dougald Stewart was widely read as well, and uh, the Scottish philosophers uh, uh, made most of the curriculum at Harvard and other schools. And I think un until virtually until the, until the 1850s, John Locke was still the main philosopher, which is hard to, hard to believe, perhaps. And as far as Kant is concerned. Now, that's, that really is a problem. I mean, for the sake of brevity, I just mentioned uh, imagination and, uh, and, uh, uh, and faculty, but there's more, actually, in, uh, in lectures on art, and there's, there's, there's a great emphasis on this effort of the imagination uh, in uh, uh, encountering things that are by nahe zu groß, yes, like Kant says, that is almost too big to represent, right? And, and this almost too big sense of, of, of things almost too big uh, was actually shared by, by, by Alston. And again, it's, 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 a, it's, it's an interesting issue because Alston's correspondence, as you know, uh, has been published uh, in a magnificent edition done by, Nath by Nathalia the Wright, right? And uh, there are some letters that Alston uh, sent to Coleridge and some letters uh, of Coleridge sent to, to Alston. So there's no, there's no substantial evidence. And uh, the first complete uh, translation of the Critique of Judgment into English appeared, uh, uh, oddly enough, in the last decade of the 19th century. Right? So, so uh, of course, uh, Austin could not have read that, but maybe, again, maybe there was something between him and Coleridge. But, I mean, it, it cannot be proven, you know, 100%. Uh, 